evening, everybody, and uh, welcome. Um, it's my great privilege and a privilege, even a privilege, a privilege um, to welcome you all here to the inaugural lecture of Professor Tony Faselli, and we're delighted um, that we've come to be on this uh, occasion tonight. Um, I know that uh, we've had people coming from Oxford. Who's come from Oxford? Hands up. Well done. And um, not an easy journey, but thank you very much. Um, and we've got colleagues from across the university here as well, as well as some more colleagues from further education. So everybody is very much welcome. And as is norm for our uh, inaugural lectures and public lectures, we've all had a chance to have a cup of tea. And um, after the lecture, we will have a chance to ask a couple of questions. If you want to start thinking now, be ready with your uh, ideas. And, um, but be kind, okay? <laughs> and also, um, we have uh, our uh, refreshments afterwards as well, so I hope you'll be able to do this today as well. Um, so first, I just, I don't really think I need to do introductions uh, to uh, Professor Selly, which is extremely well known by all of you, um, but I found a few things out by having the bio that I didn't know about Tony, and um, it is uh, far too, um, long and distinguished um, um, set of information here to cover everything that's been achieved so far, more, more to come. Um, but really excited about the title that you have, Tony, because as you know, uh, further education is a very important part of the university, university's uh, commitment to education in general. We have our um, uh, post-compulsory um, uh, team, some members are here tonight, and we've got very good links and very important links. We, we value them greatly with, uh, with further education, so I think it's a great topic. I we'll look forward to it. Um, but just to, to say that um, the things about Tony that some of you will already know, well, the first thing I knew about Tony was I knew her when she was chief executive um, of the Institute of Learning, and, and I know that was for six years, but I met Tony just shortly before she, she uh, ended her, her time with the Institute, and I spotted a very good talent here, and I was very excited about the fact that we had a link with you, Tony, then as an honorary doctor at the university, and since then uh, we, we made the point of making sure that we uh, are invited you to be an honorary professor, and because of so much that you bring, your experience. Particularly, I think it's it's your experience in further education, both locally and nationally, and the work you've done with a series of professional bodies, and also your experience in governance, which is massively important, becoming even more important in the sector of education. Um, so, um, Tony is currently, I think, chair of uh, governors of South Leicestershire College, and also on the board of Mid Kent College, and uh, she is a commissioner. Uh, for the Skills Commission and for the All Parliamentary Group, and I check this is correct, on employment and skills, which is a very influential place to be. And, and I'm glad you're there because perhaps you can make sense of what's going on in the picture. It's a bit more better, better than it's been. Um, but that, that is great. And also, you, you got there because of all the work you've done both uh, within further education and also within the public sector in general. Um, and um, I think it's important to say that you're, you've got a great focus on quality and equality uh, um, around leadership and governance, which again resonates with this university's values. Um, you've been uh, a, locally, uh, a local education senior, uh, senior officer and advisor, a national director on the Learning Skills Council uh, funding body, and you've also been the dreaded national inspector for further education. Um, so it does prove that some of those people are really nice as well. Um, <laughs> Not dreaded <is> then. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you think. <laughs> Um, but you're a qualified teacher and um, actually have taught in not only schools but prisons as well as further education colleges. Um, so all of that has brought you through um, into a number of the sorts of bodies that we've already discussed. But also you have a diploma in management from the Chartered Management Institute and what's more are a fellow of the CMI, which I think again is is, is, a, is a very sort of important organisation. Um, 
and that you, as I said before, um, you know, I met you uh, when you were chief executive of, of further education, but you've also um, a lifelong um, member of NIAS, the National Institute of Adult and Continuing Education. Um, and I think the other things that I didn't know about you were that you are in the All Souls group of Oxford University, which is a think tank of some significant uh, um, influence, but dates back to the 1940s, as you just told me before we started, and also uh, a fellow of the Society for Education and Training and a member of the Institute of Directors and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. So, with no more ado, I'd like you to please join me and welcome Tony, and we look forward to the lecture, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. And only disappointing you, I think, <laughs> after that. Um, but I just wanted to start with when I was born, and you might be different, but I wasn't born knowing about further education, and I wasn't born valuing further education. But like you, I was born with a thirst to learn and a curiosity. Um, I also wanted to, more of that later, um, but I also wanted to um, cast my mind back to a couple of weeks ago in Oxford as it happens and we went to see Melvin Bragg speak and in a lecture theatre similar to this, a little bit larger and he said I just want to start by saying this is not a lecture he was talking about the peasants revolt um, it's not a lecture, in fact I'd describe it perhaps rather grandly as a talk well I would say about this, it's not a lecture it's not a talk, it's a chat. And um, more about the Japanese for chat in a moment. Um, so there are two parts to my talk. Um, the first part should take about 6 minutes and 40 seconds. Um, and there will be lots of pictures. Well, in fact, there'll be 20 pictures. So some of you might have got a clue about what I'm going to have a go at doing. Um, so the first part is about pride and learning and practice and connects with policy as well, and might be a bit self-indulgent, but you would have your own pictures and stories that you would um, perhaps put forward in, in this way too. And then the second part is about policy and analyses of further education, um, and how values and how valuing work. So to explore that um, together, I think, would be good. So without further ado, I need a volunteer from the audience who will give me a hands up at six minutes. Anyone volunteering to do that? Timekeeper? You'll do it, John. Very much. Six minutes. Okay, off we go. So, this could be me. Um, so, let's start with pride. And um, I wonder what you're proud of and what you feel good about in terms of your learning and significant moments in your life. So, this could be me probably around 1963. Um, more importantly, this is much more me doing it upside down, hanging from the wall bars um, at that age. And I was really proud, having worked hard at my skills and practicing them, <coughs> that I could hang, twirl, twist upside down on the wall bars. Not only that, I was so proud because my teacher uh, noticed these talents and uh, how much practice I'd done and brought me out of other lessons to demonstrate my, my skills to other students. So that was a very significant learning and great pride in learning. Funny, isn't it? What sticks with you? But um, kids today learning a new skill. Well, this was abroad, as you might guess. Um, and this is my brother David's two boys. So sorry that he couldn't be with us. Uh, tonight, so learning goes on through the family as others. And this is my daughter Zelda, she's also not here, she's in Sri Lanka at the moment, and she has learned, you might not recognise from the photograph, but the perfect style and elegant 10 pin bowling technique, as well as many other talents uh, and skills that she has too. And the whole family is dead proud and a bit envious really of her pizzazz on the lanes. And some of you might have come across the book by Malcolm Gladwell, The Outliers, 10,000 hours of practice making perfection, so outstanding performance. So I don't know whether the cells quite did the 10,000 hours, but uh, my son did, so later on we'll hear about that. So could you do this? Um, would you feel pleased if you had managed to prepare a flower arrangement of this standard, so floristry, more later on that. 
Um, so here we come, this is Lewis, um, our son, and he's learned a lot about economics. Very proud parents, and our grandson, Oscar, with him. Uh, however, Lewis's fabulous skills also lie in playing FIFA, where he has done a minimum of 10,000 pounds. <laughs> and he, his personal excellence, and that, that phrase, falling in love with practice, has certainly captured him. So lots of resonance with vocational learning that we'll talk about later. Here we have students concentrating and growing in pride thanks to the excellent vocational teaching at North Warwickshire and Kingsley College, where Professor Peter Lavender, uh, to my far right, is Chair of Governors, and you saw one of their arrangements up close a moment ago. Um, I last painted a picture around 1971 for my O-levels. I got a grade two, which was a great surprise to me and to the teacher. Uh, I was enormously daunted to go with my sister, Catherine, who's a practicing artist and teacher in further education, to a summer school um, in, in painting. And not just anywhere, St. Ives in Cornwall, <laughs> which is awash with real artists. Um, so I did have a go at doing something that was pretty frightening and I'm not saying anything about the results they are, nothing to write home about, but nevertheless conquering fears about learning and having a go significant. This is Alan Tucky, Professor Alan Tucky, you might recognise him, my husband, and we move from the personal to the policy. And he was speaking at a UNESCO summit last year and the policy was being agreed for global sustainable development goals, following on from the education uh, for all global goals. And interestingly, there were two very significant set pieces in these discussions and debates, and it's a bit like United Nations, all the countries lined up in very formal speaking uh, arrangements. One was on lifelong learning and one was on vocational education equally valued policies, very, very thoughtful policies, and strongly interrelated. So much that we can learn and share internationally. Um, here we have Baroness Sharp on your left, um, who is outstanding in many ways. This is a House of Lords seminar on, that I um, was involved in on widening access to the professions. Um, <coughs> she's one of several very well-informed politicians and policy makers across both houses and she is an expert on further education. Um, I say several because there are a very small, really very small number of such politicians and policy makers, so I want to draw attention to that. Um, later on, following the seminar, we did feed into the, the access to professions to the Social Mobility um, Select Committee's report published a couple of weeks ago, which a strong emphasis on vocational um, education. Verona Sharp was a, a member of that. It was November, well you could guess that really, couldn't you, um, last year. Um, further education funding was in some crisis at that point. You may have noticed, although maybe it's a bit of a back squeak in, in the overall media coverage, but there were a number of people speaking out in the press and on television, I think even on Radio 4, about the funding crisis for further education. This was pre-budget where the expectations were that, that the funds might be reduced by 25% or worse. In fact, it wasn't quite as bad as this. Um, back to Yorkshire, uh, and uh, this is Nicola Adams, is a golden post box, so she was a, well, you probably all know, featherweight uh, boxer, uh, gold medal winner in the Olympics 2012. Interestingly, and why further education, if you look her up in her bio and wiki and other places, it talks about her school, her work, obviously her sporting uh, training, etc. Uh, it doesn't refer to her being an alumnus of Leeds City College of Further Education. Uh, quite often, and very often in fact, there's a silence about further education. This is my dad, Roy Hammond, and we're going back in time, we're still in Yorkshire though. Um, my dad left school at 14 and he went to work in the wool industry. And what he learned about the wool trade, as many of his colleagues, all of his colleagues probably, was at Bradford Technical College. So I felt very early on, going to not being born, appreciating the value in further education. I'd say there's hardly a week that passed without me learning something from Bradford Tech through my dad. So whether that was about anthrax, about health and safety, about maths, Day in, day out, there'd often be a reference. So thank you, Dad, and thank you for your education. 
This is um, governors at South Leicestershire College, and this was before a governors meeting. We went to visit the English and Maths Centre, and I know there's at least one further education maths teacher in the room. One, we're at six minutes, one minute to go. What, five minutes now or six? Five minutes, I've got a minute. Five minutes, one minute. Okay, thank you. Oh, I've just wasted 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and, but that fear factor for many young people who school has failed them, for whatever the reasons, they've not got that magic A to C, maths or English. And colleges within a year, um, maximum two years, are helping them to gain that. South Leicestershire College has the highest results in the country of any college. Uh, or in the top very few colleges. So uh, a great success story, but the governor's wanting to draw attention to that. Mid-Kent have carried out research with employers, 10 out of 10 want English and maths. So again, the policy, the practice, the importance of maths. This is back to the family and the excitement of learning. This is a STEM birthday party. So this is a scientist who came and did fabulous experiments and our daughters Polly and Alice and granddaughters uh, Rita and uh, other members of the family there. The thrill of learning, the excitement at a young age. Um, abroad, so we heard a bit about uh, UNESCO and about the um, sustainable development goals, the importance of um, vocational education. This is Sweden where my cousin Joanna lives and I had the pleasure of going to the high school graduation where every group who came out from the school, um, age 17, 18, so they'd have a vocational subject group or an academic subject group, they were cheered and the buzz was just amazing. So a fabulous celebration, equal of vocational um, and academic, something that we don't quite do. This is at the Skills Show um, in Birmingham. And um, the, we asked young people with access to professions what their professional goals were, what their aspirations were. So you can probably read that just, sorry about the spelling, but um, pastry chef. And this uh, young girl wants to be a hairdresser. We've got hundreds of these. These are two colleagues from universities. Um, so Dr. Andrew Clapham and Rob Vickers, and I'm working with them on innovation in governance with East Midlands Colleges, MFEC, and there are uh, academic partners in um, this research, expanding knowledge and understanding and thinking about leadership of governance, and that's funded by FETL, so again, that further education and partnership across sectors. Isn't this brilliant? I want to be a DJ and an accountant. Um, this gentleman is from um, SEMA, the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, uh, who was explaining the different routes, including further education, that would help get that person there. Finally, and hopefully I might manage the six minutes plus, um, this is last and very proud, and not staged, somebody who wants to be a further education teacher. And so I think she was actually a school teacher. Um, and it taps into the difference that further education makes and our innate love of learning. Uh, that further education reaches some of those parts, as well as overcoming the fears that many individuals have um, as school has failed them. Uh, she will be one of a very, very proud team of 68,000 or so um, teachers in further education colleges in this country. Wow, um, we are very, very proud of our teachers in further education. How about that? Now, does anyone have ever done this before? This is a pecha kucha we've just had the experience of, which are the Japanese chat, that's where the <coughs> chat came from. And it's quite interesting because it's a discipline, I'm not saying I've done it in the best way at all, but to have a go and maybe with, with students and for the ways of communicating with pictures and the, the personal stories about things that matter to us. So you would all have your own slides, your own stories, but I think you can see from that, and certainly <coughs> my family, which is a kind of, I don't know, middle or lower middle of the range, I don't know how you describe this, but touched by further education in different ways. We can see some of the next generations who will be depending on further education, those prospective pastry chefs, accountants, DJs. We can see a little bit um, about the prejudice 
uh, against further education, the silence that often happens in policy circles, the international differences, um, the high standards that we have in further education, and more, more later on that. Um, the history has been quite different. There's a very proud civic tradition about further education, mechanics institutes, that's that part of any local regional fabric. And I know this university is very proud to be part of that and building and helping to strengthen. Help us nationally too, is what, what I'd say, please. Um, and policy, too few politicians get further education. The media pretty much doesn't get edu further education at all. So how, how does this work? How is there pride with reason and evidence and the personal stories that, that each of us would have, and each family would have somewhere or other in, in their membership? And then uh, at the heart of government, often very different perceptions, with some exceptions. So it leaves us with a number of questions. So values, well, what are the values that further education upholds and do, are they shared? Perhaps that's why we don't get the attention in our sector in the same way. Why is that? Who values further education? And what value do, does the sector offer? And how might prejudice them? We've got quite a few experts in the room actually on equalities and prejudice, so we can draw on them later. So any hard questions? I've got quite a few lined up for all of you, so uh, we'll, we'll share um, those. Because I think there's something powerful, potentially, around interdisciplinary uh, looking at issues of this sort. So social work might be another parallel. So the kind of criticism or a zeitgeist that doesn't really recognise social work in the way that was the case 20, 30 years ago. And I think something similar has been happening with further education, not valued in the same way as it used to be. And why is that? What has happened? And is it fair and rational? And if it isn't, what do we do about it? So in case you're getting worried about text, let's get to the picture. Um, so I think what I'd draw attention to here, apart from the, the obvious uh, conclusions at all, is that as a species, uh, we're all a human species, we're all different too. And at schools and universities uh, won't be enough and that further education is part of that education system and is part of the variety of life and opportunity. So there's what we're seeing here is that further education, large scale, good quality, uh, we've got an understanding of what we might mean by value, some sense of belief of what's right and what leads to a better life, something around benefits, costs and value, business terms, kind of value proposition, something about customers, the learners, um, a source of sustainable value for them and prospective learners. Interestingly, the customer distinction between the buyer of goods, which sometimes can be government or in part government, but not necessarily those who use them, the, um, the public in further education and education systems, um, the value status, the sort of perceived value of what you get. And pride, you know, what is pride? Is it a kind of, not a false pride, but knowing that you're making a difference in a way that's meaningful and actions that deliver remarkable things. And respecting ourselves, yourself, our organisation, and deserving, this university deserves to respect it be respected by others. Colleges deserve to be respected. Um, but not because we are who we are, but on the basis of evidence and uh, that we're very good, we're the best at something. And happiness, isn't it lovely? Years ago in Bhutan, when they had the happiness index, it felt really wacky, and now it's much more uh, mainstream as a way of thinking about quality of life and happiness of our society. So that happiness, which is an important measure for us, and a value really around knowing that someone or an organisation you know does something good or difficult, and that's certainly true in education. Uh, reputation, you might not like the source particularly, I don't know, but we've recognised um, that theme about the how long it takes to build and sustain a high reputation. And customer delight, if you like that phrase or not, 
um, but the exceeding expectations and building loyalty and overcoming prejudice. So we've got a few more definitions there around prejudice. I suppose what we pull out from this is the unfairness and unreasonable opinion or feeling. And I wonder if any of us, or if we think any politicians or policy makers, would stand up and say, I am being unfair, I am being unreasonable, and I am determined to be that, to, to do that. It clashes with deep values that, that we hold about being fair and reasonable. Um, interesting characteristics around um, prejudice and that notion of in-group and out-group which is social psychology's contributions but do, does that doesn't it apply when we're talking about institutions or, or, or sectors organizations or professions uh, when it's normally applied to groups of, of individuals or individuals um, and i think we can certainly see in further education the negatives being generalised from the particular. So if something happens in a college in the South West, the North East, and it's, the sector needs more audit, the sector's in trouble and difficulty, or the fact that a college has got all grade fours from Austin, that oh, it just goes to show, you know, FE is in a mess and needs uh, uprooting and, and changing. So uh, we'll, we'll talk more on that, and you'll have your own reflections too. And I think the sort of sociology, um, social science around social dominance theory and the dominant groups creating pr prejudiced, legitimising myths. So there are a number of legitimising myths that go on about further education and some of those we, we might touch on. So that just gets us going really about um, definitions that we can work with. We've got a broad understanding and you might want to contest some of those later, I don't know. So let's look at colleges then, and that's the focus of the talk um, tonight rather than wider sets of institutions. So do colleges own values that they uphold in their mission statements and their vision and uh, values? Are they fairly widespread and supported, um, you know, or, or do they great? And I think you'll see that most of these are beliefs, and they're taken from a sample of college um, college statements up and down the country, uh, and they're quite they're mostly grounded in quite deep beliefs and convictions. Interesting that a couple like effective team working or collaboration about the how. And I remember going to some discussions in the voluntary sector about strategy. And it's quite interesting to think about a strategy or policy or values, really looking at a high level why. Why do we believe? Why are we going in this direction? And a high level what? What are we trying to achieve? What, what, are, we, what are we doing? Um, and then the how is almost below the line. That's much more operational on how we might do that and when and who um, as well can go below that line. So let's come to government. And again, very in the civil service room, I was a civil servant um, myself for, for a period. Um, so I think there's something quite interesting that happened going back to 1992-3, and when further education moved out from local authorities to be a national system, better funded uh, in, over time at that time, uh, eroded subsequently, um, but it, it was no longer under the governance and the control of the local. So something very significant happened then. And it began to surface more strongly, I think, in 
2003, the white paper, which was very much around market and contestability, focusing on a how. Uh, so demand led that from you know away from supply side more to demand uh, led. Wider choice. Um, that, that's much more of a why and a kind of belief system. But if you analyse quite a lot of policy statements connected with further education, they're often about the how, national policy, and, you know, and the problems, why, why that how needs to be implemented, because the current is not good enough or is inadequate. Uh, interesting to see 2015, um, the productivity uh, paper, Creating a More Prosperous Nation, um, there's a fabulous chapter on world-leading universities open to all who can benefit. Unfortunately, no parallel chapter for further education. Um, and that, again, is part of a fairly typical um, narrative that we, we would recognise, I think, in policy terms. So that's about the college's own <coughs> values and that they're standing for, and then it's a bit about the values that government has in policy terms in relation to further education. So what do employers think? So some of our customers, if you like, further education. So broadly, um, these surveys are showing, and they're big national surveys, that employers' satisfaction rates, um, learners' achievements, so how learners succeed um, in further education and large-scale system. And also, interestingly, parents and carers of young students in further education colleges. And all of this, you can sort of boil it down with the figures to sometimes it's seven out of 10, <coughs> uh, but mostly it's eight or nine out of 10. Never get 10 out of 10 uh, for, for any system, it'd be very, very rare. So consistently from different perspectives, high ratings, high value accorded to further education. <coughs> This just shows you some of the achievement figures. So consistency is the English and maths and the different levels. So it's not that further education is brilliant at some things and then very patchy struggling um, in others. Those are some of those figures. Um, our regulator, uh, so further education. Um, this is how we do the important bit the bottom left is 82%, so another 8 out of 10, providers were judged good or outstanding. So again, an objective, a perspective, whatever our views of Ofsted, but the conclusions are that most, nearly all colleges are of good or outstanding uh, quality. But I would like to read out, I didn't want to put this on the slide, because I don't really want to, well, you, 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 Guess why? Uh, it's Michael Wilshire, who's the chief inspector. Let's just imagine he might be talking about schools or universities. Inadequate at best. Would you? What, what kind of thing? What kind of results would a statement like that get? Especially when he's in the House of Commons speaking to an education committee as the chief inspector, without fear or favour, based on evidence inadequate at best. The school sector or the university sector is in a mess. That's why government is reviewing it at the moment. Wouldn't hear it, wouldn't happen. Would be a furore, I estimate, uh, if anything like that. So, well, fortunately for many people, he didn't say those things. But what he did say about further education um, at the education committee was, and my view is that 16 to 19 should be uh, learning in school. Vulnerable learners who need a, a familiar environment, they head off towards FE institutions and they're a large amorphous institution and a number of campus, campuses and they do badly. They get lost, they drop out, he continued. Six weeks later, still in the same vein, inadequate at best, this was his speech to the think tank centre forum, the FE sector is in a mess, that's why the government is reviewing it at the moment. 
And I went to the Association of Colleges Governors Conference in March, and Nick Bowles, the minister, distanced himself from the chief inspector statements. And what the chief inspector has said is that he's given his personal views. Well, I don't need to cast the slides back, but you saw his own evidence from his own inspectorate that showed that 8 out of 10. Very weird, isn't it? How could that happen? And that's not about an individual. We've also heard, uh, he's got a very significant policy, public role, but we've also heard lead politicians saying things about further education, like it just warehouses young people. They stand still, they don't gain anything, etc., etc. So, let's look at further um, education and value and value for money. So, the satisfaction um, that learners and employers gain from it, we, we've seen that. The evidence of achievement showing value and learning and the return for that learning by that proxy measure. Um, interestingly, with Alison Wolfe's report, which some of you might have read, heading for the precipice, and that was part of setting the tone of the funding crisis back in um, November last year. Um, and I suppose broadly, what I draw your attention to is the last but one bullet point. Uh, so the figures are there about the funding, but uh, very broad terms, thinking of the mathematicians in the room, that about half the funding rate for 16 to 18 year olds um, for, for higher education funding level, uh, and then half it, and that's for 16 to 18 year olds, half it again, and that's for adults in further education. So further education at the lowest funding level and the crisis about whether or not it would be sustainable as a sector. So the national policy makers determine funding and the policy tone of further education needing to, be, to improve. Uh, interestingly, and not that this is rocket science, but by definition, most national policy makers have been broadly successful in their education. First of all, I don't know any that haven't, but we could say 99.9% .9 have all been to school. So they've had a view of school, they've broadly succeeded at school, been a significant part of their life. Nearly all have gone to universities to, to study, mostly successfully. Um, and they'll, they'll have developed a connection and a pride often, that sense of in-group, that shared experience, positive experience, um, go back to the social psychology uh, uh, analyses. And progression to adult uh, and the, the length of time in those institutions are very significant. So there's no question really, why would there be amongst policymakers that schools are needed, that universities are needed, and that they should be pro funded reasonably properly to do an important job. But few have studied or trained in further education colleges, so in that sense we're already a bit of an outgroup for further education. Um, and so there's rarely an understanding or an interest or, or, or awareness um, of further education colleges. And yet locally, up and down the country, we've got some 6,000 governors giving freely of their time, their expertise, business and education, civic leaders of their various kinds, and proud to do so, giving their voluntary time and effort. As we said before, locally families touched by further education and businesses, the average FE college works with 597 businesses. That's a big reach and a big um, engagement. 35% of large employers who train their staff do so through a college. Um, as a comparison with the university that puts us on a similar uh, par, really. Um, and <coughs> not surprising, but, but important, that employers say that young people are better prepared for work if they've been to further education compared with school leavers. You'd recognise some of these sorts of slogans um, of how prejudice works and ways in which individuals might combat that sense of an outgroup sharing characteristics. They're all the same. Muslim people, my family's Muslim. They're, we're not all terrorists. Um, invisible, I can actually see you. My hair is real. It's not, you, know, you look quite different than this. That way it's not like mine. Um, so can we read across some of those kinds of um, ways of combating 
when what there might be is an institutional uh, sectoral prejudice um, going on. I thought this is very interesting around the meta-analysis of a pretty substantial evidence basis uh, based across 38 different countries. And they found that intergroup contact and whatever your different disciplines are, you'll recognise this, I think, probably within your fields. There's some very famous work, Leon Feinstein's work, the wider benefits of learning in lifelong learning. Um, and intergroup contact reduces prejudice. And it enhances knowledge of the other, the kind of outgroup, reducing anxiety about contact with whatever might be perceived as others, um, and increases empathy and perspective. And I think it links also with reputation and changing, so more of that kind of business um, kind of discipline um, around how to change reputation. I, when I was worked at the Learning and Skills Council, I was responsible for the first ever national learner survey. Very curious that that came about from Brian Sanderson, who was a BP business leader, who was chair of the Learning and Skills Council. And uh, never it happened in education before uh, in that way. And his question was, well, if you're a business, what do your customers think of you? You've got to find out. Um, and so Margaret Hodge at the time, the minister, so it's not party political, so it's Labour uh, Conservative. Uh, she did say several times that she wanted 100% success rates. Well, 100% success rates in further education would mean that everyone who started a course stayed till the end and everyone who um, completed achieved the qualification. So nobody died, nobody had nobody had a baby ever, you know, so in order for that to, remarkable thing to be achieved. But what, and it was a not understanding, it's just, of course we all want the best, of course we want the highest success possible for, for learners. Um, but the National Learner Survey at that time, uh, 2001 2, sent a shockwave through because, the, let's say, the zeitgeist the feeling was that further education colleges weren't good enough. And yet, exactly 93% of learners from a 13,000 sample and all the degrees of confidence, etc., independent uh, research, uh, can't be wrong. 93% can't be bonkers, barking, got all muddled up and thought it was really good when it wasn't. Um, and so, another figure in that uh, learner survey, which is very powerful, is that 83% of those who left school with negative feelings about education said they felt more positive about learning having started a course in further education. So further education was a very powerful turnaround factor um, evident from the learners' views. Um, there's also facts from the 157 group of large further education colleges, again independent uh, research. The National Survey, sorry, did go on for many years, this is not a historic quirk, um, and similar figures uh, were reported as we saw earlier. Um, that the economic impact is very significant, so these were economists looking at it, so it's looking at what's the return on investment. So for the learner, these figures are per annum. Uh, so 11.2% uh, per annum return on investment for future uh, higher earnings year on year. Um, society 12.6, taxpayer 12.3. Those of you who've worked closely with the Treasury and know the Green Book, at that point it was 3.5% was a, the expectation for return on investment. So again, pretty, if you're government policy makers, pretty good investment uh, for the return. And the average difference in a regional economy that each college makes, 550 million, and sometimes creating 20, 000, the equivalent of 20,000 jobs, 17,000 jobs for each of those large colleges. Um, so the facts about further education and, and what is known, there's a powerful set of metrics about the quality, effectiveness, and, and the value and value for money um, in the sector. And the stories um, as well, the human side, the emotion beyond the um, economic, which is very connected with prejudice and with reputation, um, to help and engage policymakers in uh, understanding and connecting with the outgroup. Uh, the, the research of Pettigrew and Trop showed that 
there are some conditions, and Alan asked this earlier, well, what, what types of intergroup contact may make a difference? Or, or, is there anything we know about that? Uh, so these huge studies showed, and think about it, do you ever have VIP talks? You have VIPs coming around your college or your university and you're showing them around. Well, imagine you were showing somebody around a college and see what this might make us think about and ways of doing it differently. If they might have a bit of scepticism, a bit of prejudice lurking in their minds about the value of further education. So where the intergroup contact works most powerfully for overcoming prejudice is where they share a similar status in that context. So during that visit, they're sharing a status with the place they're visiting, with the people in that place, so creating ways in which that might happen. And that fosters interpersonal, intergroup communication. So not the kind of <coughs> but something that gets down and gets the connections. Um, common goals, maybe a common problem to solve, you know, unemployment in X or, up, or whatever it might be, so that working together on a common goal, what can be done. Um, intergroup cooperation. So working, again, that cooperation around a problem or an issue um, with a group of students, with a group of, of staff. So some kind of authenticity and support from authorities, custom or, or law. So we've got lots there that, that we, we could draw on that, that gives an authority to further education. So it's felt um, legitimate. So, so some quite powerful findings from social psychology. Um, that we might learn about and apply. How are we doing for time? We need to finish, don't we? So, these are the comments which you might recognise. Links with the photographs of the young people prejudice mm -hmm. combating. Last one, um, it's a quote, chains of habits too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken. So it can, they cre that kind of prejudice can creep up on individuals or uh, within groups. And so further education that help overcome prejudice and let's look at a reasonable, reasonable uh, pride and understanding. So what I've tried to do in this talk, this chat, is to explore pride in further education and the object, objective basis for why further education is needed. I didn't touch and I could have done upon Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, our kids, the disintegration within poor communities of social capital and the even greater need for further education uh, colleges in this country with similar patterns to help strengthen and build economic and human capital amongst the most disadvantaged in our societies to give economic and social mobility. That's a whole other series of um, talks. So lots that we haven't touched on, but we've nevertheless looked at just a, a reasonably strong evidence base, I think. And also touched and explored some of the interdisciplinary research and analyses that might help us understand what's going on and might help us get a better uh, future the better way forwards. So oddly enough, I nearly cry when I get to this last bullet point, so, which is bizarre, and I don't know why, and probably none of you will. But I do think that further education, like schools and universities, were tripartite, that we have an important role and um, the uh, working together in concert to make a difference for young people and adults is very important. We're equal partners. Um, but we want policymakers to recognise and value the further education for what it is. It's a large scale provider of opportunities for individuals, young people and adults, many who will then, or nearly all, who will better contribute to our economy and to society. And if, we're, if we consider those of us in further education, working in higher education, consider you part of an in group or on the receipt of prejudice in an out group. We'll always be self-critical and improving, 
um, and committed um, to that. So it's not to say perfection, that 8 out of 10 is not perfect, there's always room for that continuous improvement. So I think it's reasonable that we would expect policymakers to take pride in English further education on the basis of its valuable impact. Um, they should be and will become, we hope, um, and we can help them become informed and not prejudiced. <coughs> And there's an opportunity to share successful uh, further education colleges and the system that has been created and can be developed further in this country. Because it makes a difference and it does difficult and remarkable things for our nation. Thank you very much.